today I'm going to be talking about uh, algorithm design and in particular this a tool that can be used to design all sorts of quantum algorithms and so I'm calling it a multi-tool and I'm going to be mentioning a couple of uh, papers that I've worked on with other folks so I encourage you to uh, check out uh, some of the links that I've listed here in the title if you'd like more information. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about designing quantum algorithms for classical problems, and there already exist, you know, some really great tools for doing this. Obviously, the, the quantum Fourier transform is one of the workhorses of uh, quantum algorithms for classical problems, as uh, Peter mentioned in his talk, and of course, it's used in the factoring algorithm. Um, there's also the Grover search subroutine and more recent algorithms such as QAOA for optimization. Um, but these uh, tools for quantum algorithm design tend to have specific regimes where they seem like they're going to work really well or where we know they work really well. So the quantum Fourier transform, we know that is a really good tool to use if your problem has a lot of structure, especially some kind of periodic structure, like we saw in Peter's talk, those kind of periodic lattice structures. Grover's search um, searches for an item in an unordered list and Grover's search is very good at doing that one task, but if there's more structure to the problem, then Grover's search is not that always that good of a, a technique to use. Uh, newer algorithms like QAOA are really exciting um, algorithms that we hope can be used to solve classical optimization problems, uh, but they're pretty hard to analyze, although we're continuing to make progress in understanding how they will uh, work. Um, so the, the tool, this multi-tool that I'm going to be talking about today tries to kind of fill in the, fill in the gap and in this intermediate regime, it kind of works in both highly structured problems and it also works to solve unstru unstructured problems. So it kind of goes from the regime of a quantum Fourier transform to um, like a Grover search type problem. Um, not only that, but it's easy to create, so you don't need to know very much about quantum computing or quantum algorithm design to use this tool to create a quantum algorithm, and also to analyze how well it's going to do. It's it's pretty pretty easy to analyze and prove, and again, you don't need to know very much about quantum computing to do that analysis, unlike say, um, some of the more challenging uh, quantum algorithms that are challenging to analyze. I will say that this tool is in the query model. So that's a model where we assume that the kind of time consuming um, parts of the problem are looking at bits of the input. And for problems like optimization, uh, this is not really a good model. So the types of problems that I'm gonna be talking about today are not really those the same types of problems that you might wanna solve with the QAOA algorithm. Okay, so I'm basically going to talk about the workflow. Like so. If you wanted to design a quantum algorithm using this tool, how would you go about doing it? So it's a, a simple workflow. You start by taking your classical problem and then you turn it into another classical problem called ST connectivity. So there's the first step where you reduce the original problem you want to solve to this new problem. Once you have it in this specific form, that's the form that the quantum algorithm can solve. And so at that point, you can analyze your ST connectivity problem to figure out is this a problem that our quantum, our quantum computer could actually solve in a way that is fast enough to make it worth it. Because maybe you're not gonna get a big enough speed up and you decide oh, I'll just use my regular computer to do this. Um, but once you do the analysis and you can put bounds on how long your quantum algorithm will take to solve the problem, at that point you can go and actually run the quantum algorithm and it's a quantum span program algorithm. So I'll, kind of very briefly go through this workflow, but I'm, my hope is that even at the end of these 10 or 15 minutes, you can kind of follow this. And if you wanted to go and design a quantum algorithm for a classical problem using this technique, you would be able to do that. Okay, so first, what do I mean by this reduction? So a reduction to SD connectivity. So we start with the classical problem that we wanna solve. Um, so in this case, just as our working example, I'll consider that we have a a bit string with three bits, and we just want to know if it contains a one. So this is the problem of or that I mentioned before. This this is a problem that you could use Grover search on. It's not. It doesn't have a lot of structure, but it is very easy easy to describe. So that's why I'm going to be using it as our working example. And so our goal here is to take this problem that is just has to do with some unknown input string, and we want to turn that into an ST connectivity problem. So ST connectivity, we have a graph with vertices s and t. And we want to know, is there a path from 
from the vertex S to the vertex T. And if there is a path, then we should be answering yes to our original problem. And if there's no path, then we would be, want to answer no to our original problem. So somehow we take our original problem that had nothing to do with graphs and we turn it into this new kind of pathfinding problem that also answers our original question. Okay, so there, it turn, there's always a way to turn your original problem into an ST connectivity problem. And the kind of foolproof way of doing this is to use a classical decision tree approach. Um, so the idea is you just turn any classical algorithm that solves your original problem, you can take that and turn it into an ST connectivity problem. So I'll do an example of how you do this with this, our example problem. So if we're just searching for a one, a classical algorithm that does this is it looks at each bit in turn. And if it ever finds a one, it outputs one and ends the algorithm. And otherwise, if it looks through all the bits and doesn't find a one, it outputs zero. Okay, so we can create a decision tree for this algorithm. So we start at the start node, and then we have two output nodes whenever the al algorithm outputs. And we, the first thing that the algorithm does is it looks at the bit x1, and if it has value one, it can go straight to output one and end the algorithm. But if it has output, if x1 has value zero, then we create a new node and kind of continue down with our decision tree. And the next thing we do is look at bit x2 and check if it has value one. If it does, we can go to the output one node, otherwise we have to keep going. Okay, so in this way we can create, I'm calling this a decision tree. Technically it's not a tree because there are cycles in the graph, but um, this is a, a graph that encodes the classical algorithm. Okay, now this uh, decision tree can be turned into an ST connectivity problem where we identify the start node as S and the output one node as T. And then if you have an input, like for example, the input X011, then uh, you include edges in your graph if they have the correct corresponding value for that bit. So for example, for X1 in this example, uh, X equals 011, the first bit has value zero. So we get to include the edge corresponding to X1 equals zero. And then the question is, is there a way to follow paths to get from our initial vertex S to our vertex T? And in this case, we see that there is. We can go down the X1 equals zero edge and then over on the X2 equals one edge and get to T. Uh, so in this case, there is a path, so we should output one, which is what we want to output because there is a one in the bit string. On the other hand, if our input had all zeros, then there's no way to get to T, which is also what we want because there's no one in the bit string. Okay, so this is kind of a foolproof method to take any uh, problem that involves looking at bits of an input and uh, creating an ST connectivity problem based on whatever problem you're trying to solve regarding those bits. Um, there are other methods for doing this too, and I wanna mention one more because this decision tree approach, while it always works, it produces a very large tree, a very large graph, and that is not uh, ideal for creating a quantum algorithm, and I'll explain why in a little bit. So sometimes it, it's possible to be a little bit more clever. So in, we can actually encode this same problem into a much smaller uh, ST connectivity problem where we just have two vertices, S and T, and three edges, one for each of the bits in our input that only get included when those bits have value one. So for example, if we had the input 0, 1, 1, now we get the X2 and X3 edges, but not the X1 edge, but still we see that there's a path just like we would like there to be since there's a one in the input bit. Or if all of the input bits are zero, then uh, there is no path. Okay. So that is that the first step in this a workflow when you're trying to use this algorithmic tool, this multi-tool, you start with your classical problem and you turn it into an ST connectivity problem. Okay, now that you've done that, you need to analyze the how well a quantum computer would do to solve this ST connectivity problem to decide if you actually, if it's worth it to encode it up using a quantum computer. Because um, we know for some, some types of problems, you don't get a very large speed up from using a quantum, quantum computer for some of these types of um, problems and for some you do. So you'd wanna know what kind of a speed up you get. Okay, so to analyze the algorithm, you first assign a weight to each edge. So um, in the kind of simpler graph, there are just three edges. So we assign to a weight to each one. 
And then you imagine attaching a, a battery to the vertices S and T, and you think of this as an electrical network. And now anytime there is an edge that is actually present in the graph, you imagine putting a, a resistor there with a resistance uh, that is equal to the weight that's on that edge. And if there's ever a case where an edge is kind of removed from the graph because that the corresponding bit doesn't have the correct value, then you imagine, again, connecting a wire bet between those two vertices, but putting a capacitor on with capacitance one over the weight. OK, um, so now if there is a path from S to T, we, uh, you know, let current will flow through this uh, the circuit, but it will hit all of these resistors, and it, so there will be an effective resistance to the circuit. On the other hand, if there's no path from S to T, then all of the current flow will get caught on these capacitors, and there will be an effective capacitance. So what you do is you look at all possible graphs, all possible paths, where, all possible graphs where there are paths, all possible graphs where there's no path, and you can calculate for each one of those the effective resistance or the effective capacitance. Okay, then. The quantum query complexity, so how well a quantum algorithm would do in solving this problem, is just the square root of the maximum effective capacitance times the maximum effective resistance. And that's the maximum over all possible input graphs. We saw earlier that as we had different inputs, that resulted in different graphs that we were dealing with. And what's nice about this kind of everything I've said so far, if you've noticed, I haven't really said anything about quantum mechanics or quantum computing. And calculating the effective resistance and effective capacitance are things that most physicists know how to do because they've taken ENM. It's a thing that most CS folks know how to do and most, ma most math folks know how to do because they've taken graph theory. Um, so this uh, kind of opens up, I feel like, the uh, quantum algorithm design to potentially people who feel a little bit uncomfortable with bras and kets and some of the other uh, quantum notation that we like to throw into things. Okay, so you've taken your original problem that you want to solve, you've turned it into an SD connectivity problem, you've analyzed the effective capacitance and effective resistance, and that has given you, um, so you know how long it's going to take to run on your quantum computer, and now you've decided, yes, it's worth it, and I want to encode this into a quantum algorithm. And so the way that um, I suggest doing this is using this quantum span program algorithm for ST connectivity. And I'm not going to go into the details because we don't have enough time. But um, you apply phase estimation to a, a unitary that's a product of two different unitaries. I guess the main thing that I want to say, though, is that the space complexity, so how many qubits you actually need to run this algorithm, scales logarithmically with the number of edges and vertices in the graph. So that's why if you can come up with a, an encoding that uses a small graph, that is good, because we don't expect to have you know, very large uh, quantum computers, at least in the near term. And this algorithm uh, was originally developed by Bellows and Reichart. OK, so now you might be wondering, well, this seems simple and nice, but it can't be that this actually produces good algorithms. Um, it seems too simple. You know, we should need to do something more sophisticated than this. Uh, but here I have a partial list of all of the algorithms or all of the problems for which we either have optimal or best known um, algorithms using this approach. And you can see, well, a lot of these are graph problems, which kind of makes sense because we're reducing to another graph problem, so it's natural. But some of them, like the very top one, is for Boolean formulas, which don't have anything to do with um, graphs ostensibly. Um, and also the very last one uh, gives a super polynomial speed up for evaluating games. Um, so that's a problem where you have a lot of structure and that structure allows you to get a, um, improved performance better than polynomial over a classical algorithm, um, but at the same time using this approach. Okay, so I'm just about out of time. So I will just conclude and remind you that I've told you about a multi-tool for quantum algorithm design that is accessible. And by accessible, I mean that it's kind of easy for non-experts to use to design quantum algorithms and get a sense for how those algorithms will do. Um, and also, it, it's a multi-tool in the sense that it can be applied to lots of different types of problems, as we saw on this slide. Um, I have, there are several very important problems. So one thing that I just kind of cavalierly said was, OK, you just put weights on these uh, edges and calculate the effective resistance and effective capacitance. But actually, we don't know, how, in all cases, how to set those optimal weights. There are heuristics that 
that people use, and that's how most of those results came about through using heuristics for deciding how to set the weights. Um, also, we saw that it seems to be optimal for a lot of types of problems, and it'd be better to it'd be nice to know more generally when this approach actually is going to be a good approach and when you might need to resort to other tools. And so finally, I just want to thank uh, my funding sources and some of my collaborators. <laughs>